Christian or not, it's absolutely relevant to you because it gives you a biblical a perspective as to what's not only going on in the world, but where we need to be. Because we're all responsible. Even if you don't have children, uh, you're responsible to be an example to young people, to be an encouragement uh, to young people, to have an impact on the lives of young people. It's basically a Parenting 101 type of message, but uh, and I felt it was important and a good time to do that. Since uh, we're leaving off our Revelation study this particular Sunday, we'll pick it up uh, next time I share with you, Lord willing. I'm um, excited to get in the next horseman of the apocalypse. However, right now, since our women have been being really encouraged as to what it means to be women of God, I want the men and women here as well as young people to understand what God calls us all to. Uh, now, the scriptures say in Proverbs 20, 127.1, 1, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. Except the Lord keeps the city, the watchmen walk in vain. The Lord's not building your house. As Jesus said, you must build your house on the rock, spiritually speaking. Otherwise, when the storms come, your house will be devastated. The storms will come, he said, there in Matthew 7, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And it's only if your house is built on the rock. That is the words of Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, that your house will withstand the storms of life. That's key. That's very important. We just had a message last Wednesday I want to encourage you to get. I looked at seven different forms of trials or storms and how God works in the storms. We're studying, going through the Gospel of Mark on a midweek study, and we went through Jesus uh, bringing his disciples across the Sea of Galilee with a huge storm that was threatening to capsize the, sh the boat they were in and filling it up with water. I'd been on that in, on a, a number, a few times on the Sea of Galilee, never in a huge storm, although they get huge storms because of where it's juxta the juxtaposition of that particular sea, which is more like a huge lake, uh, lower, way lower than sea level. Uh, big storms kick up, and Jesus, Jesus brought them to the other side. But they wavered in their faith, and he told them they were going to get to the other side. There's a lot of lessons there, but we also face storms in life, and he, young people face radical storms with their emotions, with their hormones, uh, storms in pop culture and what's popular in the world and peer pressure and, and what's considered cool and uncool, which changes from one period of time to another. Of course, uh, we are not evolving here in our country morally. We are devolving and becoming less and less moral. And we need more and more biblical input. And we need, it's important if you want to bring your children up in the Lord, if you want to bring them up on the rock, which if you're a Christian, you need to want that. If you don't care about that, you need to check your spiritual pulse and see if you're even a Christian. Because if you don't have any desire to see your children know God, uh, you're almost dead. Uh, you know, or, you know I'd, I'd say you really need to look at, look at where you're at. Uh, this should be something, this should be our heartbeat as Christians. We should have a passion to see that our children know God and, and that they're living for God and that they're growing up in, in the Lord. Otherwise, <laughs> the Lord doesn't keep the city. The watchmen walk in vain. Your city, which is your home, will be destroyed. If the Lord doesn't build your house, not only started with a foundation, but he's not, he needs to be also the guide of your house. If he's not, we're in huge trouble. And so there's a whole bunch of confusion today in the world. And the reason is, is because people have really jacked up worldviews. Our worldview is important. Everybody has a worldview. It's how you view the world. And since people don't have proper biblical worldviews, since they don't understand origins, they don't understand that we've been intelligently designed by a powerful create, cr creator who will take into account everything we've done, and they don't look at the past. They don't understand the past. And they've been taught, many of them in our government schools, that you know, we evolved from some primordial slime by accident, and we just came about by random chance, which is absolutely ridiculous. We've looked at the scientific evidence, and it's harder and harder for evolutionists to be evolutionists. The more they see in biology, the more they understand the human cell, the more they understand human DNA and how intricate it is. More and more scientists are declaring that Darwinism is, is philosophically bankrupt. However, guess what? Even though, uh, you know, the emperor has no clothes right? And it becomes obvious to some people, it continues to get pushed and taught because of the liberal agenda. Liberal agenda, uh, academia is run by liberals, the media is run by liberals, and they have an agenda. Uh, and we know that we need to have a biblical understanding of what the Word of God says, because it doesn't matter what the truth is to many people. They're, they more have a, they're more agenda-based. Uh, many of the people in uh, powerful positions, hate God, they despise uh, the God of the Bible, and 
They'll use any ph philosophical construct they can to try, to try to deconstruct biblical truth or undermine the Word of God. So it's critical that you understand that your children are under a constant bombardment and assault from the enemy to eradicate God from their hearts and their minds. Therefore, one of your main purposes and jobs as a parent is to make sure that you are radically involved in instilling within them a biblical worldview, not only regarding past history and origins, how we've been created by God in his image and we've fallen, but also in regard to uh, the future and how there will be a future day of accounting, that there is sin, there is a sense of guilt that humans have because we've done wrong. There's a sense of understanding that for in every human culture, every civilization, there's been some kind of appeal to a higher morality. If we've evolved from some kind of slime, there would be no inner conscience, there would be no inner appeal to, to be moral. You understand? It would just simply be the law of the jungle. Uh, it would be, you know, it wouldn't be considered wrong to rape and kill and murder and do all those things because we're just slime. There's no transcendent creator, God, transcendent law that we must abide by. We're simply just ooze, you know, that, that basically became organized. And there would be no right and wrong, but deep down we all know there's right and wrong. Amen? And, and every culture has appealed to a higher morality. Uh, even cultures that have been devoid of God have appealed to some kind of, they know deep down there's got to be some kind of moral code because it's innate. And God says he's witnessed within us the very fact through creation in our conscience that he exists. People know it deep down. And you have to suppress that, according to Romans 1. That means to hold down, in the Greek, it means to hold down the truth. It means to hold something down, that word suppress. In that context, it's holding down the truth, kind of like holding Jack in the box in the box. People will hold the truth down. So why? So they can live by their their, their feelings, so they can live by their hormones, so they can live by, by whatever. And by, guys, we've got really jacked up. We're, we're in a fallen world. So we've, our, our, our uh, feelings can really lead us astray. There's a lot of people that feel like killing people, okay? They kill people. They're serial, serial killers. There's, there's, there's literally tens, hundreds of thousands of people in prisons around the world for murder. Should we just go by our feelings when you're angry with somebody and you just you know, wow, you're just really upset? No, obviously, we don't go by our feelings often because we recognize that they're evil and they're wrong. It's when you start to justify your feelings, start to justify your anger, your, your petty little, uh, you know, anger and hatred or whatever, you know, becomes transcendent above God's law, then you're in real trouble because then you're not trying to bridle and you're not trying to seek God to have, give you self-control and what have you. So it's, so it's important that our our young people have a biblical worldview that they understand the past. They understand biblical origins. And they understand the future. They understand that, that God says he'll take everything into account. They understand how things are going to go down and that everybody will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, every believer and every human being that doesn't know Christ, before the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20. And if your children are, have an understanding of this and they have a biblical worldview, that not only has a basis in biblical origins, but also an apocalyptic prophetic understanding. And along with that, an understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ and how Jesus Christ, which is central, and the main thing you must uh, uh, emphasize in your home, what Jesus Christ, who God is, and how God became a man. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And how Jesus came to set us free from our sinfulness and our rebellion against God. And, and that he died, and he paid the price, and that all their guilt can, can be eradicated through the forgiveness that comes through faith in Christ, and they can be free and joyful in him, free to be who God called them to be in Christ Jesus. I mean, if those things are emphasized in your household, that biblical worldview, and also adding to that uh, the biblical dimension, not only of biblical origins, okay, the prophetic apocalyptic demo, uh, uh, perspective, but also the perspective of the spiritual world, helping them understand that there is a spiritual world, that there are fallen angelic beings, that there are demonic forces, and we have evidence of these demonic fo forces in pretty much every culture as well. In our culture, uh, I mean, there's a constant, I just quoted recently where that man gunned down all these people at the Navy shipyard a couple weeks ago, and he was hearing voices. And oftentimes these voices encourage people to kill people or tell them that they're Jesus or something. These are demonic spirits, okay? Uh, I had a very materialistic, uh, non-Christian, more New Agey slash materialistic view before, worldview before I became a Christian. I rejected the God of the Bible, you know? 
And it, and it was through my rebellion. The Bible says rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. I opened myself up to the demonic world. I didn't believe in the demonic world. I encountered it. It was very real to me and undeniable that Satan existed, that demonic spirits existed. And then I, then I sought to find what is, I cried out to God in the midst of one of my, uh, when I was going through that, man, and boom, God delivered me. And I was like, wow, that shows not only Satan exists, but God exists. And what I did is jumped in, I tried to find what's the world view that speaks of spiritual reality and shows that there's evil in the spiritual world. And as I began to search the world views, uh, I mean, it was almost instinctive when I cried out to God that I, I just, I, I knew it was Jesus but I looked around to make sure. I mean, I look at the Quran. I looked at the JWs and the, and the Mormons and, and somebody, you know, I was given New Age magazines. I looked at all that, but you know what? It was really easy to see that it was the name of Jesus Christ and the power of God that delivered me. And his word spoke of this spiritual rebellion. And his word spoke of the prophetic and it spoke of the, the origins. And instantaneously, almost as I got into the word, my worldview changed radically. And then I realized, wow, this is all real. And then, you know, when we put videos out, uh, I, that was like 30 years ago. That's a long time ago now. Uh, 32 years ago when I became a Christian. And almost immediately I began showing people in the popular music of the world uh, how Satan was working. And it was obvious to see everywhere that Satan was very real. That he's using pop culture. So you also have to keep in mind it's not just in academia. It's not just through the liberal media, but through popular culture, whether it's music or Hollywood or what have you. You have to be very, very careful because they are doing a lot of the parenting. They are trying to, uh, they have special names for your children's, okay? Like dweebs and, and, and what have you. Uh, names for your children. I'm talking even about the corporate, you know, the, the media. They target your children and they try to make them a certain way so they will buy certain products that they consider cool. It's this whole party atmosphere and what have you. And there's a whole show done recently. Uh, not recently, now it's probably like eight years ago or so. Uh, mooks and midriffs. Mooks and midriffs uh, were the, are the terms that they use for young people that they're trying to mold into consumers of their products. It, it, money is, the, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, the Bible says, okay? And are your children are being targeted? And uh, as, you know... And there's an influence they have. I mean, you see what happened to Hannah Montana from when she was first appearing, or Miley Cyrus and Hannah Montana to now? Well, there's a picture that Lady Gaga put with her in Hannah Montana when Hannah Montana hadn't been so fully corrupted. And she said to the parents, don't let your children hang out with Lady Gaga. She was trying to take credit for corrupting her. They both kind of, you know, they both revolted a lot of people at the VMA Awards recently, both artists, not just her and Marilyn Manson, the Satanist, card-carrying Satanist artist, says, "Parents, you better raise your children better, or I'll be raising them for you." Folks, you need to be aggressive in your parenting in a loving, calm, prayerful, wise way. The Bible says to bring your children up and teach them God's word with diligence. So we need to be diligent about this because the enemy isn't resting. And shouldn't real parents who have love their kids do more in regard to parenting than allowing the, what the Satan does? Satan's quite active, but we should be caring about our kids, and we need to be bringing them up to the Lord. We need to be taking time with them. There is such confusion, and when we don't understand our origins, it allows Satan to get a real foothold. I was reading recently an article that's in the Christian Post by Dr. Michael Brown about transgender confusion, people having sex changes because they're confused as to, you know, what they are. And uh, the news from Argentina, a six-year-old girl, six-year-olds, remember when you were six years old? Who was born a boy has become, this is how it's reported, not that this is, you know, has become the first transgender child in Argentina to have her name, her new name officially changed to her identity documents. Wow. Well, story out of England. I was born a boy. Uh, became a girl, and now I want to be a boy again, Britain's youngest sex swap patient, uh, to reverse her sex change treatment. And those reversals aren't, they only change what they can change, and it's not ever like it was, and they're destroying, you know, perfectly good organs when they, when they ch first they take hormones, typically, and then they, after the, there's some changes, then they, it's just really, really heartbreaking when you think about what's going on. These little kids, you know, and oftentimes these people, these, these people that have these sex changes, they, they want to kill themselves. They, you know, they're, 
It, it's horrible. And if they understood that God created them in his image, he made them male and female, uh, because you have feelings one way or another. A lot of times it comes from parents. A lot of times it comes from sexual abuse. In fact, uh, John Cameron, we had him actually speak here years ago. He did cutting-edge research on homosexuality and its influences, and he cites study after study after study after study, many of them showing over 50% of those who choose homosex to become homosexuals have at one time in their past, or sometimes multiple times, been molested, you know, by a parent, a step-parent, uh, uncle, uh, school teacher, you know, uh, whatever, priest, whatever. And it messes up their orientation. You know Michael Reagan, or you know Ronald Reagan's son, who, the conservative one. He did a book, wrote a book called Twice Adopted. And in that book, he talks about his twice adopted because he was first adopted by Nancy and Ronald Reagan. And Nancy wasn't his first adoptive mother. Ronald Reagan's first wife ad adopted him. And he stayed with Ronald Reagan, but Ronald Reagan being the busy politician, and Nancy Reagan, he said, not really being too fond of him. Uh, he ended up, you know, in boarding schools and stuff in the summer, and he ended up having a horrible experience because a sports uh, leader uh, in the community uh, would take him and other boys up into the Hollywood Hills and play hang-go-seek with them, and they'd tell them they ought to go away separately. Then he would go to the boys, well, he knows himself personally, and tell him he better take off his clothes. And then he took pictures of him. Then he threatened him with the pictures he could show everybody if he didn't have sex with him. Then he'd take him back to his house and began to rape little Reagan. And heartbreakingly, this guy was all not only messed up from that, but he said he remembers when he was still a teenager after this had happened and afraid to tell anybody about it, that he started to wonder if he was gay. And he thought he was going to go gay. But then he realized, you know what, I wasn't like that way I wasn't like that before all those, before that homosexual guy started raping me. And he decided, nope, that's not me. But how many people, but you see, it messed with his orientation. It messed, and, and young people that are raped repeatedly, which by the way, people that do that kind of stuff, Jesus says it's better that a large millstone be hung around your neck and you be thrown to the depths of the sea than the fate that you're going to pay in eternity because of judgment. People that do those things to kids, man. It's going to be horrific for them, man. They're going to they're gonna burn like they're in the deepest and darkest parts of hell, okay? No doubt about it in my mind, because Jesus said there's special judgment for certain people, like Judas, it says, went to his own place. The religious leaders that, that uh, tried to get rich off of people and devoured widows' houses, he said, they have greater judgment, okay? So uh, you mess with kids, you're in huge trouble, man. You're a despicable person. You need to repent right now and get right with God, Make sure that's not anybody in this fellowship because you're, you're toast forever. You, and right now you have a fleeting opportunity to repent and get right with God before judgment day comes. If anybody's even entertaining any wicked thoughts like that, and if you know anybody that's involved in that kind of behavior, it's, you need to report them, you know? But I'll tell you what, uh, little Reagan, he was raped repeatedly, and then he started to question his, his sexuality, and he said it was a battle. And he realized, you know, he came to the conclusion, and praise God, the book's called Twice Adopted, because the second adoption is he was, became born again, put his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, got saved, amen? But there's all kinds of people, because there's so much sexual abuse going on, where the, their, their identity and who they are is, is just destroyed, okay? And now that's not always the case. There's several people that have become homosexuals for other reasons, okay? Uh, I have no doubt. Now, I don't believe personally that anybody's born with homosexual genes, okay? We, uh, they, they haven't been able to show that scientifically. They've been able to show dispositions with other areas of life where people are born with certain dispositions, even anger with certain genetic markers and so forth. That doesn't mean because we are fallen. As Christians, we understand original sin and that man turned from God and that we have a sinful nature. And the Bible says that we're born in sin. The Bible says children come forth from the womb speaking lies. Children are self-centered, right? Think everything revolves around them, right? Well, that's the sinful nature. And we need to recognize that that's a reality. It needs to be contended with and understood. As cute as children are, as precious as they are because they're made in the image of God, the underlying reality is there's a sinful nature there, and there, there needs to be a transformation of that nature 
as partakers of the divine nature, where they partake of God's Holy Spirit and they become new creations in Christ, not gods themselves. We don't become divine, but we partake of God's Spirit. He transforms us from within. He transforms us by His Word. Amen? So it's critical that we understand that, that our children are, are, are born in sin, though. They can be, some children be born with more tendencies toward anger. Some children have more tendencies toward lying. Some t- children have uh, more tendencies uh, toward, you know, there'll be children that are born with uh, effeminate type tendencies. That doesn't mean it's okay for them to steal if they've got tendencies or murder or what. It's not all right if you're a male, if you have a struggle because you have some tendencies to where all of a sudden, and keep in mind, it's not just our fallen, and, I'll, and you're, I'm not contradicting myself because what I'm saying is there's not a, they haven't been able to locate any gay gene. But what I am saying is that we are born with a fallen nature so Satan can exploit homosexual thoughts because there's also a spiritual world and we're all, we're in a fall. We're fallen. Humans are fallen. We're messed up right now. So I have no doubt in my mind that certain young people will struggle more than others uh, with homosexual uh, temptation. Just like certain children will focus with anger. You'll be like, you'll have kids and you're like, wow, this kid, these two kids have no problem with anger. Wow, this kid struggles with anger. What's they raised the same way. However, we also know uh, that uh, identical twins, that means they, sit, they share the exact same DNA that are twins. You know, a great percentage of them, are, one will be homosexual, one's heterosexual. No tendencies at all, which shows you that it's not genetic. However, there are some, uh, there are more genetically that are both gay than in the regular populace if one's gay. What does that show me? That's, that's very revealing to me. That shows me that it's not, ge- that genetics are, don't make the distinction. However, there's some, there, there may be some dispositional thing going on there. And there's definitely a cultural thing going on there. Cultural influence and lack of parenting and lack of teaching biblical, a biblical worldview. What we teach in our worldview is very, 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 very important. You know, uh, uh, man, I, I, Walt, Walt Heyer in the same uh, Christian Post article by Dr. Uh, Michael Brown, uh, he said he was dressed up by his grandmother as a, little, as a little girl from a few years old. She started dressing him up, and she praised him on how he looked when he dressed, get dressed up in dresses and stuff. Just a few years old, poor boy, you know? Really tragic. And then uh, eventually he becomes a married man, but he starts to doubt you know, because of his past, he also suffered a lot of sexual abuse. And he starts to doubt who he is. And then he divorces his wife and leaves his wife and children uh, and gets, take, starts taking sex hormones, gets a sex change, you know. But after some time, uh, Mr. Walt Heyer uh, begins to recognize that's not me. I've just bought into a bunch of lies. And he gets a, a sex change operation. What he can do, he changes back. It's interesting because uh, he starts a website called sexchangeregret.com. Sexchangeregret.com. The website says the Belgrade Center for Genital Reconstructive Surgery says that they have received 1,500 requests for reversal surgery. That's 1,500 folks that want that thing reversed just from that one website, folks. Some of you might have wondered how many people actually have had the surgery to go the other way and have it changed in the first place. That number jumped out at me. Uh, really, really tragic when you think about it. Take a real recent story uh, from Belgium, which is really heartbreaking. 44-year-old Nancy uh, Verheist uh, was disappointed by her sex change surgery. She decided to die after she became supposedly, I mean, at least outwardly, became a man. I hate a lot of these articles because some of them, they'll say, you know, he, they'll start calling a he. No, it's not a he. It's still a she, even though there's been some outward changes, right? Because the spirit, the soul, you know, uh, decided to die by euthanasia, by lethal injection on the grounds due to, quote, unbearable psychological suffering. She claimed that, quote, the surgery had left her a monster, now, in Belgium, you're allowed to kill yourself. As reported by the Belgian news, Verheij said after the surgery, quote, I was ready to celebrate my new birth. What a counterfeit new birth, huh? But when I looked in the mirror, I was disgusted with myself. Oh, how sad. 
My new breast did not match my expectations, and my penis had symptoms of rejection. I do not want to be a monster. But folks, there's always a story behind the story, as I've been telling you. Just hours after Nancy's death, suicide, she spoke of how as a child she was, quote, was, quote, the girl that nobody wanted, describing how her mother had complained that she'd wish she had been born a boy. So Nancy grows up with thinking, I wish I was born a boy so my mom would accept me, you know? And after her so-called mother uh, received news of her daughter's death, she said, her mother said this, when I first saw Nancy, my dream was shattered. She was so ugly. I had a ghost birth. Her death does not bother me. Her mother also said, for me, this chapter is closed. Her death does not bother me. I feel no sorrow, no doubt or remorse. We never had a bond which could therefore be broken, end quote. Are those some of the sickest and saddest and most tragic words you ever heard? That mother, so-called, is in huge trouble. She's in huge trouble. No wonder children can perceive themselves wrongly as to, or what they're to be. You get dressed up like Mr. Hire in a dress by your grandmother. Uh, your mother just calls you ugly over and over again and wishes she had a boy. You become a boy, but you realize this is, this is messed up. It's not what it's supposed to be. And then she commits suicide, and her mother is happy about it, saying, well, she, she was born ugly from the beginning. Parents, when we're parenting, our words really matter. Our words are critical. First of all, it's critical that you love your children. Amen? It's critical. We shouldn't even have to be taught to love our children. In fact, you know the Bible says that? That we're not, don't even, Paul says you don't have any need that you even be taught to love. I'm talking about Christians. Because you ought to know by the Holy Spirit that you should be growing in love, you know? But we need to be reminded over and over again. Because... Sometimes we forget what really lasts in the end is the love of God, His Word, amen, His truth. Uh, our souls are eternal, and the love that we've received and the love that we've expressed. So it's critical that you show your children love. In fact, we need to be very, very careful with this. Why? Because in 2 Timothy, you're familiar with the passage. Many of you are. It warns about what will happen in the end times, how things will get worse. And it says, know this, in the last days, terrible times will come, for men will be lovers of self. See, it'll be about self-love, covetous. Then there's all kinds of sin that comes out of that. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, inconvenient, fierce, says despisers those that are good. It's definitely happened in our day. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Sound familiar? Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. I mean, think about it, guys. That's totally what's happening today. But it says without natural affection in the King James. It says without love in the NASB. I wish they would translate the word in, those, in, in translations, the word storge, because it only appears a few times in Scripture. There's different words for love in the Bible. Agape or agapao is the verb. Agape is the, the noun. And phileo. Agape is a sold-out kind of love. Some people say divine love, but it's not just used of God's love. It's also used of loving darkness. It's divine love when it's used of God's love, no doubt, but it means just a sold-out kind of love. That's the kind of love we're supposed to have for God. It's the kind of love he has for us. He sent his son to die for us, amen. Then there's phileo, which is family love, okay? I'm sorry, phileo is brotherly love, the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, named after that. But then there's eros, which is not in Scripture, uh, used in the New Testament, but that's the Greek word for, for romantic love. And then there's storge, and that's family love, the love that's in a family, where you nurture and care for each other and you, 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 you sacrifice for your family. Jesus said a man that doesn't, I'm, he said, a, I'm sorry, the Bible says a man that doesn't provide for his own family is worse than a non-believer or an infidel. In other words, the way you treat your family, I mean, you should love all people. And Jesus says, what, how, how much better are you than the, than the Gentiles or the pagans if you just love your family? You love your enemies, even said, amen. But you're expected in the world to at least love your family. Non-believers, right? So if a believing parent doesn't provide for their children. They're worse than an infidel. So it, caring for your children is, is paramount in Scripture, and the Scriptures warn that in the last days, people were without family love. That woman certainly was without family love, amen? Calling her kid ugly from birth, not caring when her child committed suicide. 
You know, but praise God, as ugly and grim as the world is getting, I praise God for a prophecy in Malachi at the end there of Malachi chapter 4 toward the end. It talks about how God in the last days will turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the hearts of the children back to the fathers. Notice it doesn't say he'll turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers and the fathers back to the children. It's reversed. Hearts of the fathers back to the children. Then the children's heart back to the fathers. Parents, it's incumbent upon us to make sure we're doing what God has called us to do. To, uh, to love our children, to be there for our children. Sometimes you have to have tough love for your children. Okay, Loving your children isn't giving them everything they want. That's part of the reason our country's in a huge mess right now. It means discipline. We, we just finished yesterday. Tony came in on a Saturday and finished our Miley Cyrus video, which we're not showing you right now because you, we're not going to show that one. You can watch it on your own. I don't think I'm going to show it on a Sunday unless we show like an edited shortened version because it's like a half hour long, okay? And, but we show Miley Cyrus's dad talking about how he just says it. He goes, he was rebuked publicly. He was written by parents. He said that because the show made a joke out of how he wasn't really a parent in the sense of being a dad who disciplined. And on the show, we show a clip from the Hannah Montana show. She says, I'm 14 years old. You're supposed to be telling me what to do. You're supposed to be my parent. And he just wants to be your friend. He goes, well, how do you, what do you want me to tell you? You want to be one of those dads who tells you what to do and so forth? And she goes, yeah, be a dad, like a normal dad. Well, guess what? In real life, that was the deal. In interviews, he goes, I just want to be Miley's friend. So, it's, so there's parenting that's undermined even real godly parenting, even in the Hannah Montana show, guys. And then he talks about he has a great regret not being a parent to his uh, daughter. And he said, I was trying to be more of a friend and uh, not parenting. Uh, he said, I never spanked, didn't discipline. He said, and it was too late. Once the ball was in foul territory, it was too late. When I looked, it wasn't just a foul territory. The ball was way up in the stands. It was too late. Unfortunately, that show was supposed to be a show for a good family. Hardly, folks. Even back then, parenting was being undermined by the enemy. And uh, we show a whole lot of stuff, and man, it's really evil what's going on there. And you've got to be careful, and we'll talk about that maybe again in a few minutes on pop culture. But you have to be very, very wise in making sure that as parents... You turn, the hearts of the fathers would be torn to the toward, toward the children. Guess what? Our children can really break our hearts. And it can be really easy to turn off our hearts so we don't have to deal with the pain if our children go astray. That's not the way to do it. If our children have gone astray, we need to be involved in intercessory, intercessory prayer, seeking God's face on their behalf. Amen? But at the same time, recognize that we need to be true to God. And the best way to be true to God is stand on His Word, but stand in, on His Word in a loving, caring, kind way that they would be attracted to the way of righteousness. Now, that doesn't guarantee that they're going to follow, okay? Because there's the general principle, train up a child in the way he shall go, and then when he's older, he will not depart. That's a principle. But even God has raised children, Adam and Eve. Think what happened. Think of Isaiah. He said, I reared you to be godly children, and they went astray. Because there's exceptions, because sometimes the hearts of the child is just incorrigible and bent on wickedness. And Proverbs deals with that. It talks about the children that... No, matter, no amount of reproof will, because it all, you've got to put all the scripture together. Same Proverbs that say, train up a child in the way he should go, he's older one to depart, also recognizes there's certain children that will be incorrigible. And the Bible uses the word fools uh, different times of kids, and it typically means without discretion, without understanding, without a, a comprehension of what's right and wrong. But then Proverbs shows us a graduation from the naive fool, or the Greek word, or the Hebrew word used for a foolish child, uh, Child, which is naive, that just means simple, just doesn't understand right from wrong on milk. But then that child can just become from naive to a stronger word for fool, which is incorrigible. And then the last step is to become a scoffer, where that child begins to mock truth, mock God's word. Okay, That's the last stage, and that's where there's not as much hope, but you still want to pray for your children, amen? Because I was a scoffer. Uh, 16, 15, 16, 17, man, I rejected any concept of Christianity. It was a battle between me and the Christian God. I didn't know it, but I knew I was rejecting, you know, I was brought up in, as a nominal Catholic, you know. We stopped going to church when I was a teenager, thankfully, because it wasn't the, a, a, the true biblical Christian church, obviously. It didn't have the true gospel of Jesus Christ in it. But the very concept that gave me of Christianity was weak. And I began to mock Christianity. I thought it was a joke. 
And that's when I opened myself up to the wrong side and realized, wait a second, man, the joke's on me. This is real. But I need to see what the Word of God says for myself. But So there's hope for scoffers. I was one of them. Many of you were scoffers before you came to Christ. So don't, don't give up prayer and seeking the Lord. But there's so much confusion. And we need to make sure we t- when we turn our hearts towards our children that from their very young age, I mean... To say a baby's ugly and then to tell that baby it's ugly and to, and to just ridicule your child and make that child feel unloved, what horrifying experiences so many children must be having to grow up under that. I remember being a little kid and just, you know, you know young and, and hypersensitive and thin-skinned in some areas because you don't even know who you really are yet, you know, and being hurt by words. I can't imagine hearing unloving words like that from my own parents. We need to be really careful. Proverbs chapter, well, the Bible says if you hang out, well, Proverbs 28, 26, 18, 19 uh, says, like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death, so is the man who deceives his brother and says, was I not joking? What's the context of that? That you're not allowed to ever, that laughter is bad and playing around is bad? No, that's not the context. The context is what? throwing firebrands at someone, saying destructive things to somebody, calling an idiot and a moron and a fool and, and saying he's stupid and he's ugly or whatever else, and then saying, oh, I was just kidding. Oh, I'm just playing. Because what happens is sometimes when people say, I'm just playing, I'm just joking, you should not joke or play in a way that will hurt somebody, destroy them, okay? Amen? When you're throwing firebrands at them, uh, hellfire at them, uh, these are things that are destructive. And it's a lie, that old thing we used to say, grew up with when we were kids, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That doesn't come from the Bible, folks. Words can hurt a lot. Jesus warned that if you call a person a fool, you're in danger of hellfire. There in Matthew in the, uh, uh, 5 through 7, in the Sermon on the Mount. Very, very serious, folks, that we watch our words. He says, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, uh, you're guilty of murder. First John says, no murderer has eternal life in him. That's why Jesus deals with forgiveness in that chapter. So you've got to watch your own emotions and that you don't have hatred and anger toward people that abides and that you don't bring to the cross and, and take care of. Because Jesus said, if we don't forgive others, we won't be forgiven. Amen? That's teaching from his own mouth. We need to take that really, really seriously. So it's important that we love our children in word and deed. Amen? That we love them, that we care about them, that we reach out to them. It's important also that if, as a parent that you don't take out your own anger your own resentments, your own struggles on other people around you. That's what happens with a lot of people. People take their frustrations from work and they vent them at home. Wrong. Bring everything to the cross. Cast all your, don't worry about anything. The Bible says cast all your cares upon him. He cares for you. Give him your anxieties with prayer, supplication, and petition, and thanksgiving. Make your requests be made known to God. Then he'll guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Amen? So we need to be bringing things to the cross. And we need to recognize that there's a lot of confusion, and the confusion sometimes, a lot of times, comes from bad parenting. Now, you don't have total and absolute control over everything that comes into your child's heart, your child's heart or mind, but what you do have control over should be godly, amen? Should be an encouragement. In fact, uh, kids are really confused. I thought, I, I, uh, interesting, <sighs> Dr. Paul McHugh, famous psychiatrist, professor at John Hopkins University, so very prestigious. He was on a presidential uh, board of, uh, or council for bioethics, the presidential, because he's one of the most famous psychiatrists in the world. McHugh observes, speaking of male, female sex changes, surgery, he says, listen to what he says, Pro- prestigious professor at John Hopkins University. He says, it's not obvious how this, per- this patient's feeling that he is a woman trapped in a man's body differs. Now listen to this. He says, it's not obvious how this, this patient's feeling about how he is a woman trapped in a man's body differs from the feeling of a patient with anorexia, anorexia nervosa, that she is obese despite her emaciated, coquettic self. Really super skinny. You know, they think they're really obese. You know that? He says, we don't do uh, liposuction, liposuction on anorexics. Why amputate the genitals of these poor men? Surely the fault is in the mind, not in the member. You catch that? That's powerful, man. 
says you don't take an anorexic because she thinks she's fat even though she's skinny and prefer liposuction because it's in her mind. He's saying the same thing's happening with so many of these, with these people. He just, he's more absolute about it, at least in this, what I've seen from him. It's not in their members. It's in their minds. And we know if the Bible, when it says, be sober, be vigilant. If you're adversary of the devil, be sober. Someone else be sober-minded. Walks about as a roar of lion, seeking someone to devour. Earlier in Peter, he says, gird up the loins of your mind. Your loins were your, 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 you know, they, had, they didn't wear jeans and pants and stuff, you know, they had robes. So when you run, you'd gird up your loins, you'd satch them up, you know, and then you could, you could move. It says, do that with your minds. Your mind should be in a state of readiness. Satan's after our minds. We know from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 through 4, it says that Satan targets our minds to lead us astray from our simple devotion to Christ. So there's a very, there's very you got to rec- recognize, bro, brothers and sisters, parenting, popular culture, academia, the spiritual world. There are so many things that are targeting your children. You can't just expect your child to grow up and not deal with things if you are not proactively encouraging them with a biblical worldview. You understand? And you say, man, but my children are older now. I wish I would have. Hey, you know what? Start praying right now. Start talking right now. Pray that God would give you words at the right time. Just don't give up ever. If your children are children still breathing, there's still some time, amen? We're in a battle. We're supposed to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life, amen? Now, and the cultural influences are huge. I just know when I was a teenager, man, I idolized rock stars, man. I mean, my bedroom was Jimi Hendrix, and the rest was Zeppelin posters, and there was hardly any empty space for anything else. And they basically dictated to me, you know, their worldviews became my worldview. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Party. You know, that's what it was all about for me then. And where did I get that from? I just said, wake up one morning and say, I want to be a party animal. That was communicated to me by my idols. And the popular idols today are very influential. The Bible says bad company, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Bad company corrupts good morals. You have bad company, man. You got to watch who your children hang out with. They hang out with people that don't love God, that do evil things. It's going to corrupt their morals. In fact, the Bible says if you hang out with an angry person, you'll become angry like they are. Isn't that interesting? Proverbs 13, 20 says, walk with the wise and become wise. Catch that? You want your children to hang out and fellowship with people that are wise. That means they know the word of God and they apply it to their lives. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. Walk with the wise, it says in Proverbs 13, 20, and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. In other words, if you become a companion with fools, one who's disobedient to Scripture, you will become foolish yourself. That's Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. But guys, it's not just... Now today, they could have friends that they don't even know, that they're inspired by more than their friends at school or church or wherever, and that's because of what I mentioned earlier, popular culture brings these brings people and characters right into our living rooms, right into our rooms, right into our ear gate, through our iPods and our, you know, our heart gate. And you have all, whether we just mentioned Miley Cyrus a little bit ago, but, you know, who's just really off the rails and leading. And she says she's targeting young people. In a recent interview with the Today Show with Matt Lauer, he talked about how, he asked her about, you know, how many people were offended by her VMA. And she says, well, older people don't understand. She goes, she said, I'm really after the young people, you know. Guys, we're being targeted. And she professed to be a Christian. Another artist that professed to be a Christian, Katy Perry, one of the other top five female artists right now, one of the top five probably artists right now, period. She had an album out called Keep the Faith. And she signed it, encouraging people to keep the faith. But then she denied the faith. Her own dad said she became like a devil child. Now, it's kind of scary when you're saying that and you're the dad, you know. But it's interesting because she said that she wanted to make it big as a Christian artist and become like Amy Grant, but it didn't work out. She said, you know, we have her on videotape saying this, so she doesn't even crack a smile or, or she didn't laugh. She says, so I made a pact with the devil. And she became really big. Katy Perry. 
So if you're listening to her, you think it's cool, recognize that you're listening to someone who has denied the faith, who's an apostate, whose dad calls her devil child, who herself has admitted she made a pact with Satan, and whose music are you really being moved by? Well, she has a song called I Kissed a Girl. Just a few of the lyrics in the very beginning of the song, it says, this was never the way I planned, not my intention. Ah, so it's not genetic in her case, huh? I got so brave, drink in hand, yeah, that's why it says be sober, be vigilant. If you had a drink in hand, that says a lot right there. Lost my discretion, that's what alcohol does to you, man. If you're in a relationship and your spouse and you get dr drink and get drunk, don't wonder years down the line why one's cheating on the other. Or, you know what I'm saying? Because you lose discretion. And the more you do that, man, it's going to sow seeds of discord in your life. If you're a brother and you're just, you know, hey, I'm growing a Lord, but, oh, well, really, I get drunk too, and, and you start doing things that are, well, no wonder, man. You lose this. The Bible says, be not drunk with wine, which is debauchery or licentiousness, meaning you lose discretion. Ah, interesting. The song actually has some accuracy in it, but it's put in honey music, you know. So that's not the catch of the song. The song is, hey, this is cool. Lost, uh, drink in hand, lost my discretion. It's not what, I used, it's, uh, what I'm used to. Just want to try you on. That's what sex is, today, trying people on. I'm curious for you. Caught my attention. I kissed a girl and I liked it. The taste of her chariot chapstick. I kissed a girl just to try it. I hope my boyfriend don't mind. It felt so wrong. It felt so right. Don't mean I'm in love tonight. I kissed a girl and I liked it. And you know what? If she went into full-blown lesbianism after this, it would be no less a powerful message. Why? Because what she's saying is you can go both ways, and it's okay, you see. You can try things out. And uh, kids are, these are, you know, Satan knows very well that the Bible says to teach one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs so the word of Christ dwells in you richly. We teach, the Bible says that music is only to worship God. That's what it's for, folks not worshiping evil and glorifying those things that are perverted. But the scriptures tell us that, that we teach through music. Satan knows that, so he teaches through music, folks. Do you not wonder how just a few years ago, not very long ago, homosexuality was considered wrong? And it was just, you didn't have to be taught it, you just knew intuitively it's wrong. You know, you just knew it. Instinctively. In fact, all over the world in various countries, there's a revulsion toward homosexuality where they don't even have the scripture. Think what's happening right now, even in the former Soviet Union, China. These aren't Christians for the most part. But they recognize there's, you have a male and a female. They're biologically made totally different, and you put the two together, and you have babies, and you procreate the race. You put a man and a man together long enough, and you get diseases. It's destructive, and they weren't meant to be together. It's obvious, even without the Bible. But folks, we are have, there's mass brainwashing going on right now, and we went from it being a known fact, homosexuality is wrong, to now it's not only acceptable, but now what? If you speak against it, it's wrong, and you're a racist. Did that just happen overnight? Just because people woke up thinking differently? No, folks. It happened because of popular culture. Madonna kissing Britney Spears and Christian, Christian, Christina Aguilera on the 2003 VMA Awards of MTV. And Madonna saying that, hey, first people will be disgusted by it maybe, but if they keep seeing it again and again, women kissing women, eventually maybe some of them will accept it. They know what's going on, folks. And it's not popular culture alone. It's academia. It's our government, okay? Barack Obama pushing legislation, promoting legislation that has children as young as kindergarten being taught that same-sex relationships is a good thing, can be a really good thing. Our kindergartners. Can you imagine being taught that? How about getting your, sex, your understanding of sexual orientation jacked up from the beginning? There's a full-on assault, folks. So you as Christian parents, we need to guard our families, we need to guard our children, and we need to teach them a biblical worldview. You need to teach them the difference between good and evil, right and wrong, right? So they have discernment and understanding of what's right and wrong. It's critical that we do this, folks. You've got to be diligent about it. 
Because there's going to come a time we're not even allowed to be diligent about it. There'll come a time in where you can't speak, even in your own house, about what's right and wrong. Did you know that? So you need to make sure. And what do you need to teach the kids? Biblical origins. Go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 27. Genesis chapter 1, verse uh, 27. It says, God created man in his own image. In, his, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Verse 28, God blessed them, and God said to them, Be what? Fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over everything that moves on the earth. And God said it was good. It was good. He created man and women in his image, both male and female. We're equal in God's image, equal at the cross. Jesus died for all of us. In Christ, there's neither male nor female. Different roles, different tasks for us to perform because we're, we're very different as well. But it's critical that we understand and we teach our children biblical origins so they understand who they are. See, why do we know, you know, deep down, even these people that get these sex changes, deep down they know there's a problem. So many of them admit it. There's something not right. And we know certain things are wrong, like murder and theft and things like that. But when you see the Word of God and why God's, what God says about certain things be right and wrong, and the consequences of how it destroys family, it destroys culture, it destroys your soul, we start to take it more to heart. We get, a, we get more knowledge and more and therefore we can have more wisdom about how we live our lives. So it's important that you're teaching your children from the outset because I'm telling you right now, there's all kinds of parents who as their children get older, all of a sudden they find out that, you know, Johnny became gay or, or, or Joanne became a lesbian. How did that happen? You want to know that you're doing everything you can to prevent. Do you know how, what, even homosexuals admit how hard it is having that kind of lifestyle? I mean, the average homosexual, if my children, if my child started to smoke, if Josiah started to smoke, you know, huh, he'd get a smoking whipping good for the beginning, you know, but uh, not a smoke. I'm, I'm, I'm in jest here, you know. Tony, edit that out because you know somebody's going to take that to the police, you know. You know, there was a guy up for the chief of police after Gates, he was the next guy in command. He was a Sherlock, and he made a joke about uh, spanking your kid with a boat, air, boat oar. And that got him out of it, out of it, at a men's retreat. They played it, and the news played it. And, and he's, it's, obviously, he's playing around. You know, I don't even spank Josiah anymore, but it would be sufficient discipline, Josiah, right? But why? Because that would, could hurt him. That could destroy his lungs, cancer, have a terrible, you know, sad. But you know, the, the median, the... the, the Average man dies of homosexuality at the age of 39 without AIDS. Women, about 10 years later. It's because it's destructive. And we need to teach them this, and we need to warn them. We need to warn them about false origins. Colossians 2.8 says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Don't let them fall into philosophy. That's why recently I told you, I talked about Darwinism, and I love the quotes I give because no one ever gives them hardly. You hardly ever see them. Where Darwin said that he was the devil's chaplain and that Darwinism is the devil's gospel. Yeah, because it undermines biblical foundation and a biblical worldview. And that's why I quoted Darwin recently here at Blessed Hope, where he says he read Morley's Voltaire and he assists strongly that direct attacks against Christianity produce little permanent effect. In other words, Voltaire was a great cynic of the Christian faith, wrote against Christian faith, and it backfired so much because more and more people looked at it and realized that they have a strong foundation. And then his house, after he died, and, and he said the Bible ceased to exist except in libraries in a few years. Well, to this day, his house is used by a Bible society press to print Bibles. Okay? And Darwin says, you know, Voltaire's attacks against Christianity were straight on. They weren't very effective. 
He said, real good seems to only follow slow and silent, silent side attacks. And now he says he learned that from Lyle, who undermined the flood in a book on geology without ever really referencing the biblical flood. Darwin was, I'm sorry, he was quite evil. And he had an agenda. Oh, you know, but wait, at the end of the Origin of the Species, in his second edition, he puts, isn't it wonderful how God caused all these things to evolve? You know what, later on he said he was just throwing Christians a bone. And he regrets even having put that in there. He's a deceiver, folks. Okay. And sure enough, Darwinism gets taught in the schools. And at the same time, prayer, Ten Commandments get thrown out of school. Oh, kids can pray together in groups, but, you know, not teacher and, you know, so much for freedom of religion, you know. But I'll tell you what, uh, it's essential that you teach your children not only biblical origins, but you help them understand the fall that we fell as a race, that humans are not perfect, that we're in a fallen, sinful state, so we'll have sinful desires. Every single person here has the capacity for the greatest evil in their flesh. Did you know that? We all have some of the worst temptations, and we all have that capacity. That's why when we're tempted, sometimes there's like shock, there's like fear, what am I capable of? We're, we have great capacity for evil. That's why we need to make sure we throw ourselves continually at the feet of Jesus, amen, and cry out to him for mercy, and cry out to him to help us and to deliver us from temptation. Remember the old story of Humpty Dumpty? Well, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. The, the little fairy tale, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again. Because, you see, Humpty Dumpty was shattered in all kinds of pieces and fragile. And all the king's horses and all the king's men, I didn't even know horses could attempt to put something back together. I don't know how that works, but uh, couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. They were powerless. And you know what? We're powerless to put people back together again after the fall. No 12-step program or anything is going to put people back together. Oh, a 12-step program might help somebody get, stay sober for a while. But typically people in 12-step programs are still sleeping with each other's wives and, you know, involved in all kinds of evil because they don't teach biblical morality except, you know, be sober. The only one that can put us back together again is Jesus, guys, is God himself, the one who made us. And that's why you need to emphasize your children. Not only are we fallen, but the remedy is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's why the Bible says that we are being recreated into the image of Christ as Christians. We're being made whole, spiritually. See, there's a great inversion. Instead of boys will be boys and boys will be girls, now it's boys will be girls and girls will be boys. Satan likes everything backwards. In Eden, see, we're created body, soul, and spirit. But in Eden, Satan tried to invert that and turn it upside down. Put your body first. Put what you can get out, feeling first, and ignore the ultimate spiritual side of your relationship with God. That's what Satan's about. He's about inverting and turning everything upside down. That's why in Satanism, the church of Satan inverts the cross in their rituals. That's why the lead singer of Deicide has an upside down cross burnt into his head. It's about inversion, guys. Satan wants to turn everything upside down, inside out, and you need to make sure that you teach right side up, you teach them the difference. Go to Proverbs chapter 22, please. Proverbs chapter 22. Now, this is a verse that I think is so important here. Chapter 22, verse 19. I'm sorry, make sure I've got the right verse here. Ah, uh, 22, go back up a little bit to verse 6. Verse 6. It says, train up a child, which I mentioned this earlier, in the way he should go, even when he is old, he will what? Not depart from it. That's a general truth. That's, you need to train him up in the way, are you, and now the Bible says to train up your children in Deuteronomy with all diligence. So we're supposed to train them diligently. Can you honestly say as a parent that you're diligently training your children the difference between right and wrong? That's more important than, the, than you, know, the, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic, folks. Okay. If my kid is not so, if my children aren't so good at reading and writing and arithmetic, but they go to heaven, I'll be happy. But if they win contests, spelling bees, and they're nationally known, but they go to hell, I'm not going to be happy. 
Now, I'm not saying, hey, just emphasize the spiritual academic is not important. My point, my point there, don't misunderstand me, is priority is their spiritual well-being, that they're heaven-bound, amen? That's why mothers and fathers who are homeschooling, don't spend 99% of your time homeschooling them on academics and just one or less percent of the time training them spiritually. Train them spiritually most. Make that the major emphasis, amen? Right now, I'm homeschooling Josiah. He's the only child I have left that's under 18, and I'm helping my wife, and she does the bulk of it by far, but our, our, his class that I'm teaching him is basically, you know, right now, we're into uh, origins, and, uh, or we're into uh, apologetics, and understanding the Christian faith, and how it more than holds water, it's, and it's the true, ultimately true worldview. And he's being taught that. We taught that through the next two semesters. So he can defend his faith, and, and he, he leaves the home eventually uh, when he does, it, when he's, how old, buddy? I don't know how old he, he'll leave it. He'll leave it. I still got my both daughters in the house, so it could be 30 or so. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> when he leaves, uh, he'll be well-grounded, Lord willing, you know. And when I, but I don't just do it as a, you know, it's our life. So it's not oh, something new, no. He gets in the car with me, we talk about the word so often, you know. He, he, we talk about truth. We talk about scripture. We talk about, it's like, oh, poor kid, man. He must be bored to tears. No. If not, if he loves, not if you, truth, there's nothing more radical to me, and, and especially in this fallen world where they're, you know, people play all these games and everything and do this, that, and the other, you know, and it's like, wait a second, man. They're all caught up in everything but what's really going on, which to me is more wild than anything man could come up with. We're in it right now. There's a spiritual battle for our souls, which is for eternity. Tell me there's something more exciting than that. It's radical. It's kind of scary, too, when you think about it without Jesus. But if you got Jesus, you don't have to fear anything. Amen? It doesn't mean we don't talk about football and things like that, and we don't play together and stuff. We do. That's good, too. But Jesus has to take precedent above everything else. Amen? In fact, I love hanging out with, with my kids and, and, and doing things, you know? But what makes doing things wonderful and valuable and beautiful is that we're doing them in the Lord, and we know we're right with God going forward in Jesus. Otherwise, you know, as a lot of the emergent leaders like to say, oh, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. Ha! If you don't have the right destination, the journey is going to be messed up, amen? And you're going to end up in hell. And they're not going to say, then, oh, it's about the journey. No, you'd be weeping and gnashing your teeth together forever. So much for the journey then. <sighs> the scriptures say in Proverbs, where there is no prophetic vision, now listen to this, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, or they go astray, as the King James says. But blessed is he who keeps the law. You're blessed if you keep God's moral law in its New Testament context, right? But if there's no prophetic vision, listen, people cast off restraint. In other words, you don't need to just share with your children biblical origins and how God created them and that we're fallen, that we need Jesus Christ, we need to be recreated in the image of Jesus. You need to teach them about the future. You need to give them the prophetic vision of what God says about the future and what he expects of them. Do you understand? That's the biblical worldview. I mean, praise God, we're in the book of Revelation right now, amen? We're, we're really seeing God's, you know, we're not leaving this church without a prophetic vision as to what's going to happen. And then when children understand, hey, I was created by God, this is my, what I'm, he expects of me, this is who he created me to be, then they know their origins, they don't have to be all jacked up about their origins, then you share with them from God's word, hey, this is where things head, are headed. Everything is headed to the throne of God, and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord, whether you're at God's throne, or you're on earth, or you're under the earth in hell, it's all going to bow down to Jesus, everybody and everything. It's just, the question is, is where are you bowing down for eternity? Where are you calling Jesus Lord for eternity? That's the real question, folks, isn't it? So we need to teach them and give them a, a view of biblical prophecy, what the Bible says about the future. So they understand origins and they understand the future. I love the passage in the Old Testament where it talks about the sons of Issachar. It says they knew what to do. How did they know what to do? It says because they understood the times. If your kids don't understand the prophetic timeline, if they don't understand what's coming next, if they don't understand what's going on with Israel and how God says he proves that he's God because of the future of Israel, he details a prophecy, which he does. He shows us he's a true God in many ways. That's one powerful way. If they don't understand what's going on in the world around them, 
and where everything's headed, it's very easy for them to get lost in the world. Any of you guys see that movie, Born Identity, and its sequels? I mean, the whole premise is this guy's lost his memory. He doesn't have a clue who he is. And therefore, he ends up in all kinds of just instinctively trying to get out of trouble. And that's how the world is, man. They don't have, they don't, they have, have a memory of wh where we're going, and they don't know where, where, where we've been and what we're about and where we're going. Therefore, they just meander, freaking out, and in all kinds of trouble. And that's a really sad thing. In fact, it's interesting. That particular uh, proverb, go to Proverbs 29. Verse uh, 18, and I read it to you out of the ESV, English Standard Version, which is a lot like the New American Standard Version, very good translation. The reason we use NASB in this fellowship is because it's a very literal translation. It's perhaps the most literal translation in English. The ESV is very literal too. Verse 18, where there is no vision, the people are what? Unrestrained. If your children don't have a vision of the future, they won't be restrained. Why? because they'll have no fear of God, they'll have no sense of accountability, and they'll just go with their emotions, hormonal feelings, uh, whether it's anger or hatred or lust, they'll just walk in it. So you need to give them a prophetic vision of the future. It's absolutely critical that our children have an understanding. And in regard to their gender, the scriptures warn in Romans 1, through 32, about those who are unrestrained in their behavior because their minds are darkened, it says. And they get involved in all kinds of sexual promiscuity. It could be, you know, fornication. It could be homos uh, or adul adultery, okay? And, and don't think if you're, you're a man and you're not a homosexual but you're in adultery that you're somehow not involved in the serious sin as homosexuality. They're both on the same vice list. Both are hellbound. Amen. Or you're involved in fornication. You're sleeping with women and stuff, and you're not married, and you're, hey, you know what? I'm going to get close to this girl, and I'm going to get with her and be with her and stuff. And then you come to church, and you think, but I'm not involved in adultery or homosexuality or bestiality. You need to, the Bible says, better marry than burn. You need to get married or abstain. Amen. So these are very, very serious things. It's interesting, the, the Greek word in 1 Corinthians 6 for those who will not inherit the kingdom of God, homosexual, and homosexual is then effeminate. And the word effeminate literally means soft, and uh, it can mean soft, but when you look at it in its Greek, uh, it has to do that with those who took a female, the female role in homosexual sex. Okay? It means more than just that. When you look at, in fact, it's the Greek word that's used in the law when the Bible forbids homosexuality. And now the Old Testament in the law is written in Hebrew, but the Septuagint is written in Greek. So it's interesting that it uses, so when Paul wrote that, to, he's a Jew, amen? A Jew of Jews, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He's using a word from the Old Testament law that condemns homosexuality and bring it over to the New Testament, a Greek word, because they were using Septuagint, the Jews in those days, they would immediately recognize that that's on that list of those that abomination of God. So they weren't misunderstanding that meaning. As some today, there's people going throughout Christian churches saying, oh, Christians misunderstand this meaning. It didn't mean homosexual. Ah, no, it does, man. Lakos, and it's uh, M-A-L-A-K-O-S. Uh, and these words are used... I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I want you to understand that uh, we need to make sure we tell them about the future. Last passage I want you to look up with me is Ecclesiastes. It's uh, simple to get to right after Proverbs, which you're in right now. Chapter 12, verse 1. It says this in verse 1. Remember also your what? Your creator in the days of your youth. Before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. Young people, are you listening, young people? You got your Bibles open, I hope? Or look to a Bible next to you? Ecclesiastes 12.1. 
Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. Why? Because in the days of your youth, you're already supposed to be putting on the whole armor of God to stand against the devil in the evil day. And if you're not doing it now, when the evil day comes, you will be waylaid. You'll be laid waste. And you'll have no delight in your years. Right now, too many young people are not very intelligent at times, and they're like, oh, well, you know what? My parents, they, before they knew Jesus, they lived wild lives. I just want to live wild like they, they'll get right with God for later. Oh, that's Satan dangling a carrot leading you to the lake of fire, man. I wish I could go back and change all the bad things I did, not glory in them. We don't glory in them. In fact, when I bring up my past, it's typically to show what a bad, you know, the, the bad examples, the bad, how Satan deceived me. There was no intelligence there. There was no, it was just foolishness. And you don't, want to, you don't want to live a destructive life. You want to glory in evil? That's not the love of God. You want to right now, the Bible says, to serve the Lord when you're young. You want to bear fruit for him while you're young and you've got a lot of energy. In fact, go to verse 11 through 13. Or 14. The words of wise men are like goads. Goads were like long sticks that kept an ox on its path. And masters of these collections are like well-driven nails that are given by one shepherd. God wants his word to be like nails that hold us together so we don't fall off the wall and become broken again. But beyond this, my son, be warned. The right of many books is endless, and the excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. Not that some of it shouldn't be done. Obviously, he's at the end of writing Pro uh, Ecclesiastes here, and he wrote Proverbs. Verse 13, the conclusion... Here's a conclusion. When all has been heard is this, watch. Fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. You know the incentive he gives in the very next verse as to why we should fear God and keep his commandments? First of all, he says it applies to everyone. Don't think it applies to somebody else but not you, God's word. People can be so foolish and say, you know what, man, you know, everybody else this applies to, but somehow I'm going to get away with it. No. The Bible says don't be deceived. You'll reap what you sow. Amen? Then he tells us not only applies to every person, but why you should fear God and keep his word. Verse 14. For God will bring every act. Bring what? Every act to judgment. Everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Everything you are doing and I am doing will be brought up. Jesus said there's not any secrets. It doesn't stay in Vegas, right? We've talked about that. What happens in Vegas doesn't stay in Vegas. Jesus said it will get shouted from the rooftops. Everything's going to be seen. There's no secrets with God. He's, we're like we're naked before his eyes, it says. We're going to stand before God on judgment day. And here's what's going to happen. You're going to be judged either on the basis of what you did or on the basis of what Jesus did for you. It comes down to that. And ultimately, you need to teach your children. They need to fear God because everything's going to be brought into judgment. And then by doing that, the law leads us to, it's a tutor that leads us to who? to Jesus. They need to make sure you lead them to Jesus. That you do what you can. You can't force them to, but you let them know. We're going to be judged. Your children need to fear God. Children have no fear of God. Proverbs is about kids, that, ones that have no fear of God, that run to shed blood. You know? It says that kids get together. It says in Proverbs 1, they don't fear God. They didn't choose the fear of the Lord. And what does it do? It says they, got, they get together and they run to shed blood. Remember the story in the news, what, a month ago? Some kids just agreed to kill a little boy. They just ran to shed blood. They didn't have fear of God. You need to teach your children they need to fear God because they're going to stand before him. And it's a terrible thing to fall in the hands of, of the living God, the Bible says, for he's a consuming fire. You teach them also that God's a serious God. And he's serious about rebellion against who he is and his nature and him as God, the creator. He takes into all things account. But this God has also got a love who became a man and died for them on the cross and paid for their sins, everything that they've committed so they can be Forgiven and set free and become children of God and made, remade in the image of Christ. Here's the thing. We're all going to stand before the judgment throne. Now, those who embrace Jesus will not be judged in, in regard to eternity, heaven or hell, in regard to what they've done. Did you know that? It says if you believe in Jesus, it says in John chapter, um, it says in John chapter 5, 24, I believe, he that believes... In Jesus and the Son will not come into condemnation. It says he's passed from death to life and will not come into condemnation. If you're trusting Jesus right now as your Lord and Savior, 
Whatever you've done in the past, if you're trusting Jesus, it's washed away, it's forgiven. Whatever you do in the future since you become a Christian, according to 1 Corinthians 3, you'll suffer either reward or loss based on what you're doing for Jesus. And you'll go, your works will go through a fire, and the, those that remain that were done for God's glory will be like you know, precious stones and jewels. What was done for yourself will go up in smoke and we'll suffer and lose reward and we'll have other rewards for what we've done for the believer. So we'll be judged if we're trusting Jesus based on what he did for us. He died on the cross and paid for our sin. We're declared righteous, amen? For the wicked, they'll be judged for what they've done. Revelation 20, 11 through 15 says the books will be open and anyone's name who's not written in the Lamb's book of life will be thrown in the lake of fire or in the book of life there will be thrown in the fire. And guess what? It says there'll be, you know, Revelation talks about in different places, there'll be no rest day and night forever and ever. Pretty scary. You need to teach your children the word of God. I remember Tony Maddox, when he came, he was living in Burbank before he moved to Simi Valley, and he started coming to Blessed Hope Chapel. Doug Stebbles didn't invite him. And he had a fear of God, and he just needed to grow in the word and his knowledge. But he, I asked him, you know, how did you, he goes, my mom read to me the book of Revelation, put me on her knee when I was a little kid, and put the fear of God in me. I never lost it. Tell your kids about the past and about the future, amen? Encourage them in the word of God and emphasize Jesus to them. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Be in love with Jesus and be a great example to your kids, amen? Teach them a biblical worldview. Let's all please stand. I'm gonna pass out the cup and the bread.